Take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a few moments ago, Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. The message today is entitled Environment Choices and Predestination, and we see a great deal of conflict uh, between those things in the way that we often think. And yet, because God is sovereign, and because God has predestined, and God has elected, and God has provided eternal salvation, we discover that in the mind of God there is no conflict in these things. The message that I preached last week, When to Disobey the King, I think is perhaps one of the most important messages that I have preached since being here. It ties in well with some of the things we, we have looked at in the Gospel of John and also in the book of Acts. But it is a very important lesson to learn if we would understand the things that we want to talk about today. You recall that last week we discussed the Hebrew midwives uh, who lied to Pharaoh about his command to kill all of the, unborn, uh, the babies as they were being born. Pharaoh had had three plans to try to get rid of the Jews. His first plan was to 
curtail them through slavery and rigorous work. That plan failed. They continued to multiply. His second plan to curtail the Jews failed, which was what we would call today partial birth abortions. As the baby was being born, if the midwives saw that it was a boy, they were to kill it on the birthing stools. His third plan to curtail the Jews also failed, which was the plan of infanticide. That is, after the babies are born, if they are born Hebrew males, then you take them and you throw them into the river and let the crocodiles eat them. That plan failed also, as we discover, because as Moses grows to adulthood in the book of Exodus, we see the Jews are still enslaved and they are continuing to grow in terms of their numbers. And so Pharaoh makes their bondage even more bitter. We saw last week that this series of events is referenced by Stephen in his sermon in the book of Acts in chapter 7. Because Stephen uses it as a key and crucial turning point in the history of Israel. And we saw that whenever a nation stoops to these kinds of depraved acts, we reach a crucial turning point in that nation's history. And all throughout the Bible, we find multiple turning points where things could have gone one way or the other, based upon the actions of God's people. The scriptures are given to us that we might learn what pleases God and what displeases Him. The scriptures are given to us, Paul explains in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, so that we would not fall into the same kinds of sins that God's people have fallen into in the past. And although God is sovereignly in charge of the minutest details of history, Yet somehow in the midst of that, he holds us accountable for the choices that we make. And the choices have very real consequences that play out not only in the life of the individual, in the life of a family, but also in the life of a nation. The first issue we dealt with last week was that God did not bless the lying of these Hebrew midwives. We saw specific quotations from scripture that make it clear that Satan is the father of all lies. And Jesus is the truth. We also looked at the issue of Rahab the harlot in Joshua chapter 2. And how she was spared even though she lied to the ones, the king's soldiers who came looking for the spies. But we saw also that the reason that she was blessed was not because of her lying, but because of her faith. Not once in scripture does God commend lying. Instead, we find both Rahab and also the midwives commended for their faith in the living God and for their obedience to divine law as superior to human law. It's true that believers sometimes lie and sometimes sin, but that doesn't therefore make it right. We also need to remember that God is sovereign and can work out the problems that we face in our lives without having to tell lies. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that she may be able to bear it. You know, all the way through my high school years, I camped out on that verse. There were constant temptations, constant pressures, constant pulls and tugs one way or the other. I was living away from home at a Christian boarding school, but there are plenty of temptations even at a Christian boarding school. And so this became sort of a, like a focal verse for me. And how glad I am that God called my attention to it. 1 Corinthians 10.13 so that's what set the stage for us to understand the principle of when to disobey the king, those who are in authority. And the main issue that we deal with when we are covering that subject is that you never have the option of choosing when to disobey. You say, but you've got to disobey sometimes. Yes, that's right. But it's not a matter of choosing when to disobey. You see, disobedience is not an option. Disobedience when it is required, is an obligation. 
Let me say that again. Disobedience is never an option. Disobedience is required when it is an obligation. God has established the entire structure of authority on earth. And since God has established the authority structure, it is our obligation to always obey those in positions of authority over us, whatever that sphere of authority is, the home, the church, the government, and so on. Because their authority over their entire sphere of authority is assumed in Scripture. Disobedience is only permitted when it is required by God. And when it is required, it is not optional. When disobedience is required of God, I think there are only six general instances when disobedience is required by Him. And some of those overlap. Let me remind you of them quickly. Disobedience is required when the one in authority requires you to disobey the Bible. Disobedience is required when the one in authority prohibits you from obeying the Bible. Disobedience to authority is required when a lower authority requires you to disobey a higher authority. Disobedience is required when a lower authority prohibits you from obeying a higher authority. Disobedience is required when one in authority requires you to lie or to keep silent about the truth. Disobedience to authority is required when an authority requires you to pit one biblical requirement against another biblical requirement. And we saw the illustration of the Sanhedrin, which was requiring Peter and John in Acts chapter 4 and in Acts chapter 5 to disobey the command of Christ to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. They were prohibiting them from doing that, and they were pitting that authority against their own ordained authority. The Lord Jesus Christ made it clear in the Gospels that they were to obey those who sat in Moses' seat. But here is Moses' seat contradicting the Bible and which of the two is the higher authority. They were pitting one authority against another authority that was ordained by God. If you claim that you have to disobey, you had better be ready to prove that your authority has required you to disobey the Bible or is trying to prevent you from obeying the Bible in one of these six different areas. Otherwise, to disobey those in authority is to disobey God. But it's more subtle than that. And I want to expand on it a little bit because it helps us understand what's going on in the text today when Moses' mother hides him in a basket of bulrushes and sets Miriam to watch him. Disobedience includes those times when you know the will of the one in authority and you choose not to do that will. It doesn't merely include specific detailed commands and prohibitions. Now those of you who are parents or grandparents know how this works. When your children are little and tiny, you have to give them very specific detailed commands. Otherwise, they respond to you, but you only told me not to touch that particular little piece of figurine. You didn't tell me not to touch that plate right there. When you're dealing with little teeny kids who are not mature, you have to give very detailed instructions. And we as parents, over the past however many years it's been, wearied ourselves with telling our little tiny children the specific details of everything, that this is a no-no, and this is a no-no, and this is a no-no, and this is a no-no. And if you missed one of them, you know which one the kid goes for always? He goes for the one that you didn't say it specifically, this is a no-no. You see, that's, that's a sign of immaturity when we have to have detailed commands, otherwise we want to argue with God and say, well, you got some principles out there, but you know, I'm not interested in the principles, I just want to know what are the detailed commands. I ran into that in college, for example, where kids would come up to me uh, who had been caught uh, smoking, and they'd say, but the Bible doesn't say you can't smoke. Okay, come on. Can we not understand the will of God through the principles that he has set down in his word? Such as, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if you defile the temple of God, you'll get destroyed. God not only gives us specific commands and specific prohibitions, but he sets down for us general areas of obligation whereby we bring him the greatest amount of glory and the greatest good to God's people. 
And when we want to argue petty things like, well, the Bible didn't say I can't take heroin. There's no place in the Bible that says thou shalt not take heroin. Or that thou shalt not abuse drugs. Or that thou not, shalt not break the speed limit and so on. No, but it tells us to obey those in authority over us. You see, folks, when we're dealing with the will of God, when we're dealing with obedience and disobedience, our goal is not merely to list the 639 laws of the Old Testament, but our desire is to find out the will of God expressed not only in the laws, which are merely illustrations of the grand principles that he has set forth for us, that we might lead lives that are pleasing to him. If you must disobey, better be ready to prove it. And learn to grow to maturity. Mature Christians, for them obedience includes being sensitive to the will of those in authority, not obstinately and defiantly only doing the things that we're forced to do. David expresses it this way in the Psalms. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. The eye doesn't say anything. The eye doesn't list a, a set of rules of do's and don'ts, but the eye guides. I can remember when our children were little, and they were starting to do something perhaps that was not very appropriate in the presence of visitors. And I could look at them, and as soon as they caught my eye, silence ensued. Because they knew there were consequences. I will guide thee with mine eye. And then the next verse. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. You see, that's where you have to force the issues. God wants us to be a people who are sensitive to his will. the more closely you understand the scriptures and the holiness of God, the more you will be sensitive to his will. Mature Christian obedience means being alert and eager to do the will of the one in authority because that is the attitude that reflects the Lord Jesus Christ. It's only the immature, the little babies, the little children, the carnal Christians who have to be given the detailed rules. Because if you don't give them the detailed rules, then they'll have an excuse for disobedience. Like, but you didn't tell me that I had to wash all the dirty dishes, including the pots and pans. You just said wash the dishes. Or, you know, you uh, didn't tell me that I had to, you know, clean up my entire bedroom. I thought it was okay to shove it under the bed. <laughs> have you ever run into that, parents or grandparents? Of course you have. You see, for a mature Christian, we want to look for ways to please those in authority, even when we're not told to do the job. That is the attitude of Christ. We find a quotation from the Psalms that is reiterated in the book of Hebrews concerning our Lord Jesus Christ. In Psalm 40 we read, Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Bird offering and sin offering hast thou not required. You see, pleasing God is not merely a matter of going through the rituals. Oh, how we wish it were. Because then you could do the ritual and be done with it and not worry about what your heart was like. But pleasing God is not a matter of going through the rituals. David understood that in the Psalms. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. What a difference. And it's quoted of Christ in Hebrews chapter 10. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, and here's the quotation from Psalm 40, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared me, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hadst had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God.
That's our Lord Jesus Christ. He did the Father's will even when it was unpleasant. He did the Father's will even when it was costly. He did the Father's will even when there were things that were more pleasant to be done. So here once again are the six times that you're required to disobey a lower authority. God and the Bible are always the highest authority. And it's not an option, but it's a requirement. Those six things. When you're required to disobey, when you're kept from obeying, when you must disobey a higher authority, when you can't obey the higher authority, when you have to lie or keep silent about the truth, when one biblical requirement is pitted against another biblical requirement. Make sure that when you disobey that those principles, one of those principles is in place because otherwise you are disobeying God. Now as we continue our text today, we find that there is a group of people today who are all worried about the environment. There's a group of people today who are all worried about free will. There's a group of people today who are all worried about predestination. And they never think of the other things, only that's those subjects. Folks, we have a sovereign God who ties it all together. He's made us stewards of the earth, we understand that. The, the left-wing folks who go out there on a, a green limb someplace are not us, I hope not. We do have a biblical mandate concerning the creation around us, but it does not become our God. For many of those people, it has become their God. And they worship Mother Earth. And they think that even though they are schizophrenic in this, that evolution is true on one hand, that we are destroying the, the species, all these things that are going extinct, and not tying it together that the theory of evolution says survival of the fittest, and so those things went extinct, so what? You know, there's a very, very strong disconnect there in those people's thinking. There are many people who think that God is not in control at all. He's sitting up in heaven just biting his nails and wondering what's going to happen down here on earth. But you know, when you have a sovereign God, God is in control even of those people who think about God like that. Have you ever thought of that? Even in control of those folks who absolutely do not believe in election, absolutely do not believe in predestination. We see illustrations of that in our text today. This man of the house of Levi marries another of the daughters of Levi, they are descended 400 years from uh, Levi, from the 12 tribes that began the children of Israel, which came down to Egypt in the days of Joseph, and Jacob is still alive at that time. So 400 years later, here we find marriage between two members of the same tribe. That's going to be very important later on, as we get further into the book of Exodus, where God begins to reveal his plan concerning the priesthood. And, in particular, concerning the high priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood, both of which will be types and pictures of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's a man, an ordinary man, a common man. Here's a woman, an ordinary woman, a common woman. And they get married, a common activity, with absolutely no inkling of the future that God has prepared for their descendants. Dear folks, God is always at work behind the scenes directing and ordering history in such a way that he will receive the greatest amount of glory. We start with a key heritage, a tribe for whom God has special plans, the Levitical priesthood, the Aaronic high priesthood. When we are called upon to obey in the normal course of life, we do not know what the divine sovereign plans are that God has laid out for us. Here is the normal course of life, the marriage of a man and a woman. And from that is going to come a priesthood. Did you know that illustration is used of us in the New Testament? 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness 
into his marvelous light. Folks, that's written to us. We have no idea what God is going to do with us. We who are common people in the normal course of life and the decisions that we make, how God will use that in an immense way in the future. Amram and Yochelet, Moses' parents. How little they knew at that point what God was about to do. And yet they did what was right in the context of normal daily life. Another verse from Peter, verse 5 of First Peter chapter 2. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. You are part of that edifice that Christ is building when he said, I will build my church. The Old Testament priests offered up bulls and goats and rams and lambs. They offered up meal offerings. They offered up all kinds of different types of offerings, trespass offerings and sin offerings. And on Yom Kippur, the high priest carried the blood in and sprinkled it upon the Ark of the Covenant. You and I are called upon to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Oh, that's an exciting subject. Wish we had time for it. But it includes not only prayer, but it includes the way in which we live. We are to present our bodies a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Well, there we are, back to the will of God again. The perfect will of God for the believer. We've been called upon to offer up those spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ that you may prove what is that good and acceptable. Acceptable. Is your life as a holy priest and the sacrifices you're offering acceptable to God by Jesus Christ? Another verse, Revelation chapter 1, verse 6. He hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. When you trusted in Jesus Christ, though it wasn't just a matter of having a fire insurance policy, an escape ladder from hell, you were placed in Christ in the heavenlies. You were seen in him. And you were made a king and a priest unto God his Father. Are you living that way? How about Revelation 5.10? And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. You see, what we have going on here is a normal couple, in the normal course of life, and yet with no idea that what is going to come forth from them will be the first leaders of the nation of Israel. Kings and priests. Sometimes in the normal course of life for the Christian, it puts us in conflict with the world around us. We find requirements by those in authority to lie. Well, I could give you lots of illustrations of that. I'll choose just one. Uh, I have a, a relative who, uh, when in college, was working for a particular company as a, uh, a receptionist. And uh, she uh, was told by her boss that when she answered the phone, that she had to lie and say, the boss is not in, may I take a message? Even when he was standing right in front of her, she had to say that lie. And she said, well, I won't do that because I'm a Christian. And to make a very long story short, after the backs and forth on this issue, they finally fired her. And she ended up going to a school where she met the man that she's now married to and involved in ministry. 
You see, at the time, it seemed like a real horrible crisis. It seemed lo like the loss of a very good income at a time that she needed it. But God, in his wisdom, had something better for her. Suppose she had lied. Suppose she had gone down the road of compromise. What would then have happened? We don't know. Only God does. Sometimes those in authority require you to cheat. For example, a bookkeeper in a business being told to, you know, cook the books a little bit. Sometimes we're required to steal, like taking money under the table so that we don't have to pay taxes on it. That's stealing, you know. When you get taxable income that you don't pay taxes on and you lie to the government about it, you're stealing. Requirements to be immoral. There have been many who have faced that temptation to get a job promotion. If only they'll go along with the suggestions of the boss. Requirements to kill. Christian medical professionals faced with demands to assist in abortions or in euthanasia. Folks, we face the same kinds of temptations by those in authority over us. And here's a young couple with their third little baby. Miriam has been born, Aaron has been born, and now here comes Moses. They're faced with the choice of obeying the higher authority or obeying a lower authority, much to their danger and the danger of their child. Sometimes, as we see here in our text, our attempts to do right are perhaps weak and irrational, but God honors our desire to obey his word. When she could no longer hide him, verse 3, she took, him, took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. A mama, having reached her wit's end, knows she cannot kill her baby, is not going to throw him directly into the water, puts him in a little basket where he won't be flailing and throwing about and causing attention to any carnivores in the river, puts him in the rushes, and then tells the big sister, hide out there and watch what happens to him. Take care of him. Kind of an irrational way to try to protect your baby because that's a little baby that's going to continue to grow and then trying to sneak him home at night and sneak him back in the morning and sneak him home at night and sneak him back in the morning and make sure that he's not in the house whenever the soldiers are coming to check. Folks, many times what we do is irrational and it's weak. But you know we have a God who loves us. A God who sees our heart and our earnest desire to obey Him even when we don't understand how. But we make the little attempt to obey Him. And what a blessing God gave to her. This big sister, of course, is watching as Miriam, as we later discover, and the older brother Aaron. But you know, it's interesting that here in this portion of the Word of God, as he did on several occasions throughout scripture, God chose the youngest brother who was brought into being in the time of trouble to be Israel's redeemer. David, for example, was the youngest of Jesse's sons. And he was called on to be the one who delivered Israel by the hand of God, though the people had chosen Saul. God picked out the youngest one. Well, many others that we could speak of as well, but what we find here is we don't know. And how would you know if you choose to cut off more children whether God has a special plan for the youngest child yet to be born? For we are entering a time of trouble. The next thing we notice is that God sent a compassionate woman, not a soldier, to find Moses. Now you've got to understand, this is going to be an area that was within the access of the palace and the place of the women. And so there would have been guards protecting it. And the woman that finds him first, that sees the basket and sends a maid to get it, is someone who has the authority to protect him. She is someone who had a knowledge of who he was. It says the babe wept and she said, 
This is one of the Hebrew children. For the Egyptians were not circumcised, but the Hebrews were. This is a woman who had a God-given desire to protect him. Not merely the authority and the power to do it, but a God-given desire to protect him. And here, I think, is a very interesting and key issue as we consider the sovereignty of God and the absolute control of God over every situation. She, in fact, made a choice, a right choice, to protect him and to raise him with the best that Egypt had to offer. We don't understand the ways of God. And the things that God uses in our lives to bring us to the point whereby we then will be called upon when faced with good and evil to choose the right and refuse the wrong. You see, God was also tempering character in Moses because Moses was going to have to make an even bigger decision than Pharaoh's daughter made. Moses was going to rise to the great authority in Egypt right under Pharaoh. And Moses was going to have to look at the things of the world and say, Man, I have lived a good life. I've got 40 years under my belt. And it has been good. And I have enjoyed the banquets. And I have enjoyed the freedom. And I have enjoyed being the boss. And I have enjoyed all the learning. Man, we've learned astronomy. And we've learned physics. And we've learned mathematics. And we've learned how to build pyramids and you know whatever else he learned. I learned it all. I've really got it under my belt now. And then he looks out his window and he sees these dirty, bleeding slaves starving out there, being beaten. He says, now what do I want? Do I want the palace? And I want this, this nice swimming pool I got out here. And I want those really fancy boats that we go up and down the Nile River on. Go fishing trips and go down and visit all these fancy monuments and so on. Do I want that? Do you want to be able to interact with all these other sovereign kings of other nations around us? Or would I rather get down there in the dirt and have somebody whipping me and starve? You see, God put Moses in a position where he was going to have to choose something that was more valuable than the treasures of Egypt. But the road to get there was a very hard road. We don't have any question about that. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. It's an interesting verse. Why would he do that? Because, you see, Pharaoh's daughter had made another choice. Pharaoh's daughter wanted the pleasure of having this little baby, but she didn't want the work of raising him. So she says to Miriam, go call me a nurse. And who does Miriam call? Of course, she calls Moses' mother. God, in his sovereignty, provided wisdom beyond her years for that little girl, Miriam. God is sovereign and overrules in the affairs of men. God met the deepest yearnings of a mother's heart when Miriam called Moses' mother. And Moses' mother not merely nursed him, but she taught him something else. She taught him who he was. So when he was 40 years old, he said, that is who I am. Those are the people of God, and I will be counted with them. The law had not yet been given. It was through Moses that the law came at Mount Sinai. What Moses would have known were the great promises to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and to those wretched, miserable creatures that he saw out his window who were being beaten and tormented. It says, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. You see, God had provided something for Moses. 
God had not only provided a right, so-called politically correct, external environment, which would be the testing ground for him later on, but God had provided the right spiritual environment in those tender growing up years. You know, you and I are going to be called upon to make the same kind of choices. Do we want the material things of the world or do we want the things that will last forever? You know what Moses chose? It tells us in verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt. He had the two paths laid out in front of him. You can go down the path of Egypt. And all those good things will be yours for a time. Or you can go down the path of the promises of God and those things that you do not yet see, which you must grasp by faith, those things will be yours forever. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. How many times when we fail God and choose to go along with the evil commands of someone in authority is it because of fear? Faith and fear cannot inhabit the same heart at the same time. One will drive out the other. There's a struggle, it's always going on, Will it be faith? Will it be fear? Will it be faith? Will it be fear? Will it be faith? Will it be fear? The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured. This is something that is going to take a period of time. As seeing him who is invisible, that means you have to keep your eyes on heaven and not on earth. To see the one who is invisible is to walk by faith. Oh, what we learn from this passage here. If you are among God's elect, he will also provide the right environment, training, experiences for you. But you are going to have to make some critical choices when the time comes for your test. And so the question becomes, how will you respond? When the test comes, what are the choices that you will make for which there will be consequences that last for all of eternity? Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for the challenges that it gives us because it speaks in terms of where the rubber meets the road. It's not theory. It's absolute practice and for the Christian who walks by faith, a practice that is empowered by the Spirit of God, to the glory of God. Father, make us a people who love you, a people who earnestly desire to do your will, a people who want to in everything, even though we don't always understand it, desire to obey you, a people who learns that you are a God whom we can trust. For you are the true and living God. And you have given us the great privilege of calling us your Father. You are our Father because of what Jesus has done. Gracious Father, thank you once again for the privilege of studying your word. We pray that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please, and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.